Hello everyone, blessings to all of you who are in vertical fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So we are two days before a historical presidential election. And as I fellowship with other Christians, I hear all kinds of people saying, hmm, I don't really have a reason to vote in this election. And uh, they give all kinds of reasons for it, like, oh, I, I, I hate politics. I, I'm not going to vote because I hate politics. And there are others that say, well, I don't believe that my little vote is going to make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. But the, the biggest reason, surprisingly, that I hear from all kinds of fellow Christians is this reason. Well, in this election, much like in the last one and the one before, all these politicians, all these candidates that are running are corrupt. And none of them really meets the, the, the standard of, of moral character that I would like to see in a national leader. So I'm not going to vote for any of them. I'm just going to stay home and not vote. So let me ask you this. If you are one of those Christians that is struggling right now, and many of us are struggling because maybe some of these reasons are valid as people verbalize them. But let me ask you, is God still in charge? Is God still sovereign over this election? Can he perform miracles and wonders on behalf of God's people? Of course he can. And so let's trust him. Let's look into his word. And in this process of choosing the leader, the leader for our nation, let's trust God. And there goes the title, choosing the leader for a nation. So our text today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16. Um, some of you remember that uh, Samuel was God's prophet. We have the book of First and Second Samuel that ultimately was written by him at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And during this time in chapter 16, the nation of Israel was in uproar. Not unlike our nation, it was during the time when the political things were changing and the existing king, King Saul, was phasing out because God has rejected him and a new king was about to be appointed. And so Samuel at this point was kind of in seclusion somewhere in Rama or somewhere where he was grieving over God's rejection of the political leader of the nation of Israel. And there was sort of a time of insecurity before the new leader came on the scene by God's choosing. So God was tightening the screws on the nation of Israel. And many people were wondering, including Samuel, is this going to be God's judgment over us or are we going to see God's mercy? Is this going to be God's anger poured out over our nation because of the sins that the king has committed and the people has, have committed? Or are we going to get another chance? And so before we read the text, before we begin reading the first 13 verses, of this great chapter, let's ask God's blessing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you are about to teach us because we are in turmoil right now as a nation. And I pray, Father, by the power of Jesus, the risen Savior, that the people of God would trust you for your prophetic interference, that we would trust you and walk with you in obedience and, and we would be grateful for the chances and the options and everything that you lay before us, even during this time of political uproar, in this time of changes, in this time of insecurity that is exacerbated, exacerbated yet by other circumstances like this uh, global pandemic and, and all of that fear that is out there lingering. And so, Father, we just pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to descend upon your people, to descend upon the leaders whom you have chosen, and that in that power, in that outpouring, we will trust you unconditionally, even the way that the prophet Samuel trusted you. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. So here is the good news. As we begin reading this text, know this and register this. 
there are three things I want to share with us. And here is the first one. God always has a plan. No matter how dire the circumstances may look, God always has a plan. Here is chapter 16. Follow along as we read. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So God always has a plan. That's the good news. But in the unfolding of God's plan, there are all kinds of steps that are included. And so few steps that I would like to point out. Number one, it all starts with a prophetic revelation of God. God speaks. He speaks to his prophets. He speaks to his apostles. He speaks through them, through people. In verse 1, we see that the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? So, hey, I've rejected Saul. He's a failed leader. I don't want him uh, to lead my people. And uh, I've rejected him from being a king over Israel. What do we know about Saul? We know a lot if we study the Word of God, right? Saul had a good start. He was popular uh, primarily for his looks because he was, as you remember, a head taller than others. He was a warrior. He was strong. So people liked him. He had some early victories over God's enemies, namely the uh, ever-present victory the f over the enemies, the Philistines. But unfortunately, Saul had a weak heart. He did not have a heart after God. He had a heart of disobedience that kept escalating, and he had a heart for himself. He had a heart for popularity and self-gain and all kinds of things. And there came a tipping point in the chapter just prior to the one we are studying, in chapter 15, when he was given this one-in-a-lifetime chance to annihilate the sworn enemies of God, the Amalekites. Maybe you remember it from your study of the Word that God at one point declared that he is at war with Amalek. All right? So Amalekites were the descendants of this evil king. And Amalek in the Old Testament represents the enemy, represents Satan, the devil himself. And uh, so Saul was given this opportunity to have a victorious battle over these enemies, but he was commanded not to take anything that belonged to them, not to bring it to his camp, to, to Israel or to Jerusalem. He was commanded not to spare any of the enemies, and not only he disobeyed and he took some loot, some spoils, but he also... He also brought the sworn enemy of God right into God's camp. Now, sometimes the people of God, even Christians, make that same mistake. God says, listen, I've rejected this, or I've rejected this practice, or this person, this kind of behavior. I have rejected those things. And Christians just take them, bring them right into the church. I'm sure that you have seen it. I have seen it. So in this case, God was so angry that in several places in chapter 15, he actually states through Samuel that he regretted making Saul the king. And he rejected him as the leader of Israel. And that is really amazing because if you remember all the way back to 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 8, the choosing of Saul was <laughs> about as close to an election as we can imagine. 
Because at that time, unfortunately, the sinful people of Israel were crying out to God and they were crying out to Samuel, their prophet. Give us a king. Tell God to give us. We want a king. We want to be. And here is the key, key verse in that chapter. Give us a king that we may be like other nations. Now, that's tragic. Because you see, God set his people apart not to be like other nations. Now, I believe that the people of God, the followers of Jesus Christ, whether they are in the nation of the United States or in other nations, we are also set apart not to be like other nations, but to be the citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, to be distinguished, to be set apart for God's worship, God's service, the proclamation of the gospel, and to be different from the world. But as you will see in this text, the people of Israel failed God in that. And I believe that we have a lot in common with them, even as we try to follow God, but our hearts are not really after him. And so for these reasons, uh, Saul was rejected and God was tightening the screws on Israel. And he said to Saul, here is the good news again, fill your horn with oil, verse 1, and go. And I will send you to Jesse because I got a leader. All right, I have provided a leader for myself, he says. I have provided for myself a king among Jesse's sons. So notice, it is not for the people, it is not for the nation, it is not for some global agenda with other nations, but for myself, God says, I want a leader that is going to represent me, that's going to have my heart as his first interest, a leader after my own Heart. So it starts with the prophetic revelation of God. Then the second thing that follows as God unfolds his plan is the faith challenge. So here it comes. It comes to the people of God. Samuel was the first one that got the challenge. You can see in verse 2 that he's all perplexed about this command of God. And he says to God, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord was gracious, and he says to him, look, this is how we're going to do it. Take a heifer with you, take a little calf with you, and you will say when you get to Bethlehem, I've just come to sacrifice to the Lord. And that was true, that much was true, right? And so the rest of it was to unfold in God's plan. See, Samuel, in his own understanding, in his own flesh, considered himself a dead meat. Like, I'm dead meat. This evil king who is still in power, and all the more, since his power is failing, he is going to kill me, but God essentially says to Samuel, I want you to walk by faith, and I will show you what must happen. Do you remember in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that, that without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here we have Samuel who is comforted by God and he goes to seek God to be a part of the unfolding of God's plan. He draws near to God and so he trusts God for that reward. And, uh, and what follows ultimately are the specific instructions. Write that down. That's number three in the unfolding of God's plan. It is the, uh, the specific instruction in verse 3. Now, I have to say that the specific instructions are specific to our walking by faith, not necessarily the way that we like, but the way that God desires us to walk. And oftentimes, the instructions are such that God really doesn't give us any other choice. We have to walk by faith because that's the way to please God. Verse 3 says, God said to Samuel, invite Jesse to the sacrifice, invite his sons, right? And then he said simply, I will show you what you shall do. You see, the details from God often don't come up front. Many of you have experienced that many times in your life. God revealed to you something, maybe you're moving, or maybe uh, there is another plan for ministry, or things are changing, and you're kind of wondering, like, God, show me, God, show me, and God says, well, I want you here, but then you really don't know. You have to wait, you have to pray, you have to fast. That is not uncommon. The Bible is full of this kind of uh, faith walk prompting from God. 
Do you remember Abraham in Genesis 12? God said to him simply, hey, pack up your stuff, take your family and go. You will worship me on the mountain that I will show you. Do you remember Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when God speaks to him through the burning bush and he says to him, hey, I'm going to send you out, I'm going to train you, and then for the next 40 years, Moses was shaped into being one of the greatest leaders that Israel ever had. So the details don't come up front, but they come as we walk by faith in obedience. And that's the last thing. That's where the participation of God's people really takes off. Write that down. Number four is the obedience of God's people. Verses four and five say, Samuel did what the Lord commanded, right? He was obedient. And so he comes before the elders of Bethlehem. And it's interesting because, as you can see in verse 4, the elders come to meet him and they're all trembling. They're in fear. And they ask him this question, do you come peaceably? He says, yes. And then ultimately he challenges them to consecrate themselves for something that God is doing and invites them to come. Why were the elders trembling? Well, if you have a credible prophet of the magnitude of Samuel that essentially approaches the city by himself with a sacrificial animal, the elders were all insecure because that would essentially mean that there is a need for atonement by the prophet and that the animal is going to be slain. So maybe they thought, wow, it's a heifer, it's not a goat, it's not a pigeon. And so there's probably some major crime that was committed. Did somebody murder somebody or what happened? Did we transgress against God? So they were insecure. They say, are you coming peaceably? But he affirmed them because God was unfolding his wonderful plan through him and he was walking by faith. And so he demanded obedience from the elders as he did from Jesse and his sons. And so the big picture that we see here in verse 4 and 5 is the fear of God is a good thing, isn't it? When people of God fear God and obey God, it is a good thing. When there is no fear of God, there is all kinds of disastrous things. In fact, I believe that if there is no fear of God or lack of it, that that's really the worst thing that can happen to the people of God concerning the unfolding of the plan of God. So I want to encourage you, if you have any doubts about this election, you're kind of wondering, does God have a leader for our nation? Who is it going to be? What am I going to do? How am I going to vote? But look at these points that we just made. Maybe I should put them back on screen for us to see as a summary. So do we have a prophetic revelation from God? Well, I believe we do. I believe that God has spoken and spoken many times to the people of God, even those that may be prophetically gifted, that he has a leader for our nation. Now, ultimately, it's going to be decided on Tuesday. God's going to reveal that on Tuesday or maybe thereafter through the circumstances through which he wants us to walk by faith. So there is the faith challenge to God's people, and we have to walk in obedience to what God has provided and ultimately to his word. And so ultimately uh, there is the faith challenge with specific instruction. Now you may say, well, what are the instructions? Well, what are the instructions to us? We have some wonderful privileges in our country that was founded on Christian principles. And one of those privileges that we have is to go and participate in the will of God by simply voting for these candidates. And God then ultimately decides, not based on our vote, but based on his sovereign will. But our vote in that is very important because we either participate in God's will or we don't participate in God's will. So keep that in mind as we go through this because it's crucially important. Our participation in God's plan as God's people is crucially important. God's plan, you see, is always bound to what God has spoken. So it's bound to his word. God's plan is unchangeable. So for us, again, as we're going to read the next five, six verses, the crucial thing is, are we going to participate in this plan that is unchangeable? Let's pick it up in verse 6. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought that would be the oldest son. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel, 
Do not look on his appearance, on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shamach pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, mm, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So God always has a plan, but God's plan in how he chooses the leader for a nation is unchangeable. He's already got it figured out. And here is the tricky part, because you see, we as sinful people, people always try somehow to change or add to or, or alter God's plan in our own selfishness, in our own self-righteousness, in, in our own fleshly discernment. So the fulfillment problem of God's plan is really in human fallenness. There are three instances that we can see in this part of the text how people try to fix the plan that they were not entirely f comfortable with, right? So the first one that we have here is very applicable to us as well in our situation is interpretive inaccuracy. So when you have a prophetic speech, prophetic word that is given, it needs to be accurately interpreted according to what God is actually doing, not according to what we want God to do or what God is not doing. Verse 6 says that when they came, that is Jesse's sons, when they came before Samuel, Samuel looked on Eliab. So the oldest son goes first, right? And he thought to himself, ultimately in his heart, he didn't say it out loud, but he thought to himself, oh, wow, surely the Lord's anointed is like this Eliab here. So in this case, Samuel almost, almost, made a self-reliant judgment as the prophet of God. Aren't you grateful that he actually was listening to the Lord and he was obedient, that he did not make that judgment even though the temptation came to him? Well, it's not always the case. You know that there were prophets of God that prophesied falsely, and many of them, and uh, the nation ultimately incurred God's judgment because of that. And it is not different for us today. We have all kinds of prophets around us, people that claim to be prophets. They hear from God. They speak concerning this election, concerning all kinds of other things of this nation. And the greatest challenge in that is usually their own presumption or their own flesh, their own desires or the entitlements or the will of the people, all kinds of things like that. You see, sometimes even the prophets think that they got it figured out. Maybe as they look at the leaders, they also look at the appearance. Um, oh, this one is handsome and tall and it's the firstborn or it never happened this way and maybe it's a unique situation. Maybe God's going to do it because he's kind of doing something different. So it must be him. It must be the leader for our nation. But um, unfortunately, this is how errors, even in prophetic discernment, are made. And all kinds of false prophecies are spoken about this next presidency. So I want you to be very cautious who you listen to and especially who you believe. Because there are plenty of prophets that I have heard that said, oh, Donald Trump is the next president, and others say, no, 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 Joe Biden is going to be president. And yet others that are claiming that there is going to be this mysterious leader that's going to rise up from the unknown, some uh, person that is not even running right now, but they're going to be quickly put there just about now, you know, right before the election, and they are going to be elected, and God has spoken. And so, listen, obviously all of these cannot be true, right? And many of these prophets have prophesied falsely, and they are in imminent danger uh, 
of the judgment of God and along with with those that believe them that act upon their false prophecies because there are a lot of presumptions that are justifying their flesh we can see that in verse 7 as Samuel actually listens to the Lord look at verse 7 with me because this is going to be a very very important verse for us the Lord said to Samuel do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him does that sound familiar who was before chosen because of the demand of the people because of the height of his stature King Saul the failing leader right we want a king we want to be like the other nations we want to be this global cabal involved people we want to be like the rest of them we don't want to be set apart from God now that's exactly what happened so I am here to tell you my friends one national leader is going to stand at the end are there any signs are there any indication which ones this is driving us crazy God can't you just show us right which of these prophetic utterances is true well so as human fallenness stands in the way by interpretive errors it also stands in the way of the absence of spiritual discernment so here is the key part of the verse that I really want you to zoom on and perhaps even memorize and many of us have seven for the Lord sees not as man sees man looks on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart so I have my own experience with people looking on the outward appearance you know many of you know that um, we love going to minister in central Europe so yeah, I have been there more than two dozen times and we stood on the streets of my country and many other countries and in the Czech Republic where I come from there are many people that hear the gospel and hear it from my preaching hear it from my mouth from the evangelism and in my hometown or in my region where people know me and still know me my classmates or people that have met me before and knew what I was like for the first 24 years of my life and and ultimately the fact that I was imprisoned during the communist uh, era for a better part of two years you know some of them say oh, well I mean he speaks well and he wants to tell us about God but a jailbird is always a jailbird and he will never change people don't change we should not listen to him that's another scam he's telling us about God let's just move on I don't want to hear this but there are many people praise God I, I praise God for that many people that say wow this man has really changed I mean from the selfish and 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 spoiled and and really corrupt person from the communist prison fearful and violent and all of that uh, just defending himself he comes here and he preaches forgiveness and he has forgiven all those people that that have hurt him and his family during communism and that can this be can really can can there be a God that causes the change in man's heart and so some people give in with the prejudice of the past that I ultimately carry in my own baggage or some give with the voice of the Holy Spirit when they are able by the power of God to look on the things objectively and perhaps from the spiritual perspective not as man does based on my outward appearance but based on a spiritual discernment that ultimately is from God and they are able to at least listen to the gospel and many of them have come to follow God because of that so I just wanted to point that out that this is not such an uncommon thing because somebody once said that good things all right can become bad things when they conceal the best things and sometimes the outward appearances conceal even though they may appear to be a good thing the best things of God and so if we don't give in with these appearances and we pray and we ask God as he looks at the heart that we look at the heart fully perhaps we will be given the same discernment and there is overwhelming evidence for the language of the heart and you may say well what is the language of the heart well the Bible tells us exactly how we can see how the heart is revealed here is how Jesus put it he said in Matthew 15 verse 18 what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart you remember when we make apologies sometimes we can get away or often get away with saying 
I'm sorry for what I did to you. I didn't mean it. But <laughs> this verse actually tells us, no, you did mean it because what you said and how you offended these people came from your heart and then it came from your mouth because it was in your heart before. And with religious people, even Christians, it's even more serious. Jesus hated the fact that these uh, religious people, these Pharisees, these Pharisaic believers were duplicitous in their followership of God. And so something came out of their mouth and never meant it. They didn't do it by faith. And he said to them at one point, Matthew 12, verse 34, listen to this, very important. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Listen to this, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It is the same concept, right? Before it came out of my mouth, it was in my heart. So I guess hopefully from now on our apologies would be like, forgive me for what I said because I meant it because it was in my heart first, but I want God to change my heart. That would be a really a viable apology before God. So how does it tie into what we are studying here with this whole election complexity? Well, what comes out of the heart of the candidates that God has put before us? Well, you may say, well, pastor, it is simple. I mean, when I look at the candidates that are on television, what comes out of their mouth is arrogance, lying, deception, boasting, self-centeredness. Well, that may be true, but is that really just the appearance? Or have you looked at the heart? Have you asked God to look at the heart of these people as they speak with their mouth? Are there any that are saying other things? Right? Is there anything else that comes out of their heart through their mouth? Is God sovereign over those confessions? You see, remember, God said to Samuel, I'm going to choose a king for myself, and I'm convinced that in our nation, because we claim to be one nation under God, God wants to appoint the leader that he chooses for us, according to whatever circumstances he deems to be appropriate. So, do you think that God sees ahead of what's going to happen? So, here we have ultimately a young man named David who is a shepherd, but he's going to grow up to be a king. Do you think that God in his sovereignty saw David's heart? Well, what kind of heart was that? God said that he's going to choose a man after his own heart, that's for Samuel 15 and Acts chapter 13 as well. And so we have the confirmation not only in the Old Testament prophets, but with the New Testament apostles that spoke that. But what was David's heart like? Well, let me share with you in case you forgot what this man after God's own heart was like if you want to focus on that. Do you think that God saw David's adulterous heart as he was lusting after Bathsheba to go and commit adultery with her? Do you think that he saw his murderous heart as he plotted to kill and ultimately killed her husband Uriah, a man of God and warrior? Do you think that he saw his lying heart as he lied about the whole thing and lied throughout his life, even as he lied to King Achish when he pretended to be crazy to save his own skin rather than relying on God? Do you think that he saw David's violent heart. Man, uh, David was a man of violence. I mean, there was a point in his life when he was a mercenary with his killing machine, mighty men. But it, they were going from, from uh, one suburb to another, from one part of the country to another, just at random, killing all these Philistines that were enemies of God. But there was so much blood spilled that ultimately God punished him for it and said, look, you're not building my temple. You got too much blood on your hands. You're a killer. All right. David was a man of violence. Do you think God saw his heart in that? Do you think that he saw David's boastful, politically rotten heart when he was boasting in 1 Chronicles chapter 21? And he says, hey, I'm going to throw a census to see how great I am as a king. What kind of people, how, what, what the numbers are? And his commander of his own armies comes to him uh, named Joab. He says, David, don't do that. Don't you know it's a wickedness before God and he didn't want to obey him and eventually he kind of partially did. But David goes, no, 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 I want to see how mighty I am. And do you remember what happened with the boastful heart of this politician, David? Uh, God came in in a form of an angel and the first day because of David, 70,000 men died. 70,000 fathers and husbands died 
and were slain by this angel and the angel standing there and eventually David had to repent and and uh, but that was the thing with David man after God's own heart he just kept going after God's things and he kept growing in the Lord he kept declaring himself a man of God even though by any stretch of the imagination he was not in all of his deeds and so I'm just pointing that out because there are many people, many Christians that unfortunately choose not to hear the other things that come out of the candidates' hearts. Let me ask you this. Are there any presidential candidates that have a heart for God? Any at all that speak about God, that gather the evangelical leaders and are prayed for and anointed and have prayer rallies and declare National Day of Prayer and, uh, and go and do it? And any that, that refer to themselves as Christians, followers of Jesus Christ without the denomination? And are there any that are in favor of Israel, that, that, that work out peace in the Middle East? Are there any of them that are unashamedly pro-life, that uh, fulfill the stature of Psalm 139? that speaks that we are created in our mother's wombs. By the way, you know who wrote that psalm? The murderer, the killer, the, the rotten politician, David. Man after God's own heart. Now that is a different perspective, isn't it? Is that confusing to you? Or is that really a revelation that we as Christians in our own Self-righteous attitude can be really the biggest hindrance in the unfolding of God's plan. Write this down. Self-righteous attitude. And this, my friends, I would call, even as God spoke to me about this, the error and the sin of Jesse. Is our nation guilty of the sin of Jesse? Look at verse 8. Then Jesse, all right, called Abinadab, that was his oldest son, it says, and Samuel has one message for him. No, God has not chosen this one. And so he called Shama, his, his second born, um, or third born, right? First one was Eliab, then Abinadad, uh, and then Shama. And the message was always the same. No, neither has God chosen this one. Neither has God chosen this one. So eventually seven of the sons pass before, before Samuel. Um, interesting, isn't it? The number of completion, God says, I'm done with these. That's the completion, number seven. And then comes one more. And Samuel, who initially presumed in his heart, but obeyed, that was the difference between him and Jesse, because Jesse presumed and did not obey. He acted on his own presumptions. He nominated in his own heart a list of candidates for national leadership that he approved of. He left somebody out because he never thought that God could use that person for being the next king, the next national leader of the nation of Israel. Why? Well, because he seemed not to be worthy. Oh, he's just tending the sheep. He's too young. Well, hey, do you remember who else was tending the sheep for 40 years as God was molding him into a great leader? Moses. Moses on the other side of the desert. So Samuel hears that and inevitably comes to the conclusion, hey, what are you doing? All right, maybe you're just trying to be a good dad, but you are wrong. You have your own list. You have your own agenda. Do you have any other kids? Inevitably comes to that question. Thank God he did. And the word says in verse 11, are, are all your sons here? Samuel asked. And the answer is ultimately no. I got one more. So Samuel says, send and get him. You're not going to sit down till he gets here, all right? This is urgent. Like we're here through God's business. You're standing in the way of that because of your self-righteous attitude as a man of God, Jesse. It is from you that this leader and ultimately the Messiah from your tribe, from your root, that he's going to come. And you are standing in the way of the fulfillment of God's plan. Let me share something with you, friends. So I don't know if you are aware of this, but as of October 26, 2020, there are 1,000, 
224 presidential candidates on the ballots around the United States. But only three of those candidates are viable. Why do I say that? Well, because you know and I know that in our Constitution, in the provision that God has in our government for us, these candidates, in order to be really viable, must have access to all these electoral votes, through 538 electoral votes. So there are only three candidates that have access that are actually on ballots in all the states. Because some will be lost, some will be won, but... Now, nobody gets all of them, but you have to have access. So the rest of them are already rejected, right? Oh, yeah, God can raise another leader. Well, I'm telling you, this is the provision that God has given us as the United States of America. So out of the three candidates, you know and I know that there are really just two, that, that ultimately the choice is going to be made, right? That's the ones that God put before us, these two candidates. And he says, look, I'm inviting you to participate if you look at the heart of these men, as I look at their heart, no matter what their faults are, all right, because they have plenty. Listen, all of those faults we talked about, right? And so do you, and so do I. So if we exercise spiritual discernment instead of self-righteous attitude, perhaps we'll be blessed that God has given us His choice. Because you see, out of all those hundreds of candidates, 325 Democrats, 164 Republicans, 65 um, Libertarians, and 23 Greenpeace Party candidates. There are only two that I believe, and you know that that's the case, are ultimately going to play a role in what God chooses two days from now. And may God prove me wrong. I, maybe I'll be totally wrong, and so I will stand corrected. But this is very much what it looks like. So I believe, my friends, that uh, especially because of where I come from, from the former communist Czechoslovakia, where these privileges of participating with God in what he's doing were not even granted to us. We didn't have a constitution like we have in America. All those really great privileges of standing on what the founders have established um, and having actually a voice in that, or even worshiping God. We didn't have that. And so I am convinced that, unfortunately, a lot of Christians were like Jesse, or are like Jesse. They make their own list that is far gr greater in their demands of moral characters and things that, that, that God has made available to us. And I also believe that if King David was here today, and we were to put him on the ballot, and he was one of the candidates, he would not pass. That there will be many, hundreds and thousands, maybe, maybe millions of these Christians that choose to sit home, that would say, okay, David, well, let's look at his record. What do we have? A murderer? Man of violence? A liar? Oh, conceited politician who was boastful? Hmm. Well, God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to participate, because you just simply did not give me a candidate that meets my own standards. That is the sin of Jesse in his own list. And my friends, I just want to tell you, as one who has this unique background of coming from a country where all these privileges of participating in God's plan or even worshiping God freely were denied to us, I'm telling you, we would have given anything if we could have had a voice in God's will. We didn't have that. And so... Listen to me. If we have those privileges as the one nation under God that we claim to be, and we do not participate in what God has entrusted us, I would not be surprised if gradually God would just deal with us the way that he dealt with Israel so many times. Captivities, right? Rejection of these privileges in his will. Essentially say, look, you want an evil government? You want to be China? You want to be, what, um, Assyria? You want to be... Uh, whatever you don't like under the oppression of some other nations, you want to be part of this globalist agenda. Oh, we want to be like any other nation. Just let us choose a leader for ourselves. Really? Really? You would not pass God's candidates because of that? Well, that is the sin of Jesse. And here is the statement I want to make to us. And if it's worth of anything to you from me as your friend, Note this, 
we will never give God our best as a nation if we do not give him first our all as his followers. Let me say that again. We will never give God our best if we don't give him our all. Because God's plan will ultimately prevail. And by God's grace and by his mercy, may his plan be for our good, not for our captivity and for, for our correction. All right? So you see how this story ends? It ends well, doesn't it? That is good news. That is hope. God's plan will prevail. That's the third thing as we close. You can see, and I'm going to put these verses on screen again. You can see as they brought David in that he was, it says he was ruddy, you know, kind of had a reddish hair, I suppose, and he had beautiful eyes. He was handsome. Isn't that interesting that God kind of throws in even some of these appearance things when God's people actually obey him and, and do his will, participate in God's plan. And so he goes and just tells Samuel, hey, take your horn, anoint him, for this is he. This is the man after my own heart. And then the key verse that I want to highlight for us is verse 13, the latter part that says, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. So as we close, let me ask you this. What could happen in the United States of America if we, as God's people, Christians, participate in God's plan? By, by participating in the privileges that God has given us to be a part of his choosing, of his voice, that will ultimately be revealed not too long from today. If we stop scoffing at the choices that God gives us, if we stop criticizing all these leaders that he lays before us, and rather pray for them, vote for them as our heart leads us, based on the revela revelation of their heart from their mouth, based on the values of God's word, comparing those to the values that are set before us by God, so think about it, and as you think about it, then go in two days and vote using the choices that God has laid before us as his people. Let's pray. Oh, Father, my heart is uh, heavy because um, I know that for the first 24 years of my life, I have lived as part of the nation that you have you have pruned and you have subjected it to the evil leadership of 43 years for two plus generation of the communist system and evil leaders and fallen leaders godless leaders oh father none of us are perfect we all have flaws we all boast in god we all have sins we have violence in our hearts we have murder in our hearts your word says that if we even hate our brother we have murder in our hearts and we dare to criticize the national leaders lord I just pray that we as a nation over the next two days, we would first of all repent from our selfishness. We would repent from our scoffing at God, presenting us with more choices that we've ever had and, and better choices that we've had in all kinds of past times when this nation was in crisis. But Father, we trust you that like in the past, even now, you desire to lead us out of the crisis if God's people will only participate in your plan without scoffing at the choices that you give us and in the privileges that you bestow upon us in our participation in voicing your choice so father i just pray for my brothers and sisters let there be no person that sits at home on tuesday let them get off their seat and get to the polls and cast their vote for the man after your own heart according to the choice that you reveal to them in jesus name Amen. Friends, may our nation be blessed. May you be blessed as you follow the Lord Jesus Christ because he loves you. You are blessed.
by my name shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray. If my people which are called by my name shall seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven heaven, then will I hear and will forgive, forgive their sin. If my people, which are called by my name shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray.